Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. This is my first conference post-pandemic, and uh, I really couldn't have picked a better one to actually agree to attend in person, I think. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, really fascinating. So yes, I'm going to tell you, as the mouthful of my title says, about the functional specialization and of visual cortex and how it emerges from self-supervised learning. Uh, so to uh, start with the motivation here, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, but when we look at the visual cortex of mammals, we see a variety of specializations, but one of the most clear ones is the specialization between what we call the what and the where pathways, also referred to um, due to the anatomy of the primate brain as the dorsal and ventral pathways. So these pathways are specialized in the following ways per the what and where nomenclature. The dorsal pathway is more concerned with where are things in the environment and where are they going. So you see neurons that have selectivity for movement, for particular locations. Lesions to this area mean that people and animals have trouble judging movement and trouble with grasping things and stuff like that. And in the ventral pathway, which we've heard a lot about in um, some of the other talks over the course of this conference, we instead have circuits that are more concerned with what things are there and what do they mean. So object categories, the semantic implications, recognition of faces, stuff like that. And the question that I want to ask today here with you is, why does the brain have these specialized pathways? So normatively, what is the purpose of this? And I'm going to give you a hypothesis, but to explain that hypothesis, I want to give the following observation. So think for a moment about the task of visual prediction, okay? Let's say you're trying to predict what you're gonna see in the near future. So if you examine this question, you will realize that there are two different and potentially competing forms of invariance that you have to engage with in order to do prediction. So the first is a, oh, my apologies. Let's get back there. Movement invariant prediction relating to the identity of objects. So let's say you're seeing an orange car driving to the left. One of the things you can know is that in the very near future, you're gonna see an orange car. And it's movement invariant because it doesn't actually matter which direction the car is moving in. Chances are you're still gonna see an orange car in the near future, as long as it's not traveling at some enormous speed. At the same time, regardless of whether or not it's a car, if there is some object that is moving to the left, then you can make an object invariant prediction regarding the movement. There will be leftward movement or there will be an object further to the left in my visual field in a moment. And this doesn't, it doesn't matter what the object is, if it's a car or a dog or a ball, if it's moving to the left, you're gonna see something to the left. So you have these two different forms of invariance for making your prediction. And the hypothesis that we have here as to why the brain has these specializations in the visual pathways is that it emerges from optimization for visual predictions because of these two distinct invariances that relate to the prediction task. So how are we gonna test this hypothesis, this normative hypothesis? Well, Artificial neural networks are a great tool for testing normative hypotheses in neuroscience. In my, in my opinion, they're the best tool for doing so because uh, both they match at an algorithmic level the broad principles of how neural computation operates, but also because we have good methods for optimizing them. So the approach that we're gonna take here is that we're gonna train artificial neural networks with a self-supervised loss where it's trying to predict upcoming visual inputs. And then we're gonna look at whether or not that neural network develops representations similar to those seen in the what and where pathways of the brain. Now, as a preview, a kind of you know, signpost for what you're gonna see here, we find that if you do this form of self-supervised learning with some anatomical segregation in the network, then you do get specialized what and where pathways. This doesn't happen if you don't have the anatomical segregation, and it doesn't happen if you do super supervised learning. 
And I think um, this is a point I'll return to later, which is the importance of moving beyond supervised learning in the field. Uh, if you're interested, this uh, work has actually just been uh, accepted at NeurIPS as a spotlight paper. Um, and the lead author on this is Shahab Bakhtiari, a postdoc in my lab, who's a really amazing scientist, and I'm very lucky to have managed to recruit him. OK, so. Now, how are we going to test this? Well, in order to say that what and where pathways emerge, part of what we want to be able to do is to actually compare to real brains. For that, we need a data set that has recordings from both what and where or ventral and dorsal pathways in the brain. This can be hard to find in, uh, in primate studies, um, but luckily for us, the Allen Institute is very generous with can, um, make, uh, sorry, collecting these very large data sets of visual processing in mice and sharing it widely with the public. And luckily for us as well, mice also have a similar functional specialization in their brain. I'm going to refer to the pathways as dorsal and ventral throughout a lot of the talk um, because it's referencing the, the original primate ideas. But of course, the, the anatomy is a bit different in mice. Nonetheless, what you do see in mice and ignoring the question of explicit homology, what you do see in mice is that when you examine the different higher order visual areas of their cortex, there are different regions that are more selective for movement, more concerned with where objects are and where they're moving to, and other regions that seem to be more concerned with the features of objects and what their identity is. So this data set that we're using from the Allen, uh, oops, excuse me, this data set that we're using from the Allen uh, is a two-photon imaging data set. So, you know, they do surgery on the animals, some intrinsic imaging to figure out what region they're in, get them habituated to their rig, and then they do two-photon imaging while presenting them with many, many different stimuli. Now, the stimuli that we're going to use here are uh, natural movies. One of the stimuli, stimuli sets in the Allen's data set the reason we're going to use this is twofold. One, because we want to do prediction. Sorry, one, one, because we want to do prediction. And two, uh, because in fact, as the Allen showed, natural movies elicit the clearest responses from the most neurons in mouse visual cortex. Mouse visual cortex doesn't care so much about image net images. It does care a lot about moving videos, though. And um, the regions that they recorded from were these Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button there. It's because it's green. It's the same color as the laser pointer. It was these six regions here. So primary visual cortex, V1, LM, AL, RL, AM, and PM. In our analysis, we're going to ignore RL because it's a very multimodal area, and so it doesn't give huge responses to purely visual stimuli, but we're going to study all the rest of them. Okay. So the way we're going to compare brains to neural networks is with representational similarity analysis. So the idea is fairly simple. We're going to get responses from each neuron in the circuit in, res in response to different frames of the video. So we're going to have, um, you know, for each frame, a point in high dimensional space that re represents for uh, the activity of those neurons. That's going to give us a vector of responses. And then we can construct a matrix which contains those vectors of responses for all the frames of the movie. If we square that matrix, this then gives us a new matrix, which is the representational similarity matrix, number of frames by number of frames, and it shows basically how the circuit represents that particular set of movie frames. And it gives you something like a, me a measure of the geometry of the representations in response to that movie. And what's nice about this is because you have this RSM, which is just in frames, you can compare the representational geometry of any two circuits, whether it be biological circuits or a biological circuit in an artificial neural network, or of course, an artificial neural network in an artificial neural network. So you can just take then the correlation between your RSMs as a measure of your representational similarity. Okay, now, so to unpack a little bit more um, how we're gonna do the comparison and, and get at this ventral versus dorsal question, so here um, we have the five regions I mentioned uh, that we're studying. And for each one, we can develop a kind of ventral versus dorsal score based upon uh, the existing literature that has shown the selectivity of neurons in those different regions, 
and also based upon their similarity to one another. And so this gives us this ordering where we have our most ventral area, so the, the most what area, viz LM, and our most dorsal area, um, viz AM, most concerned with movement. And then um, what we can see is a nice sanity check here is if you do representational similarity matrix analysis between mice, so you're not comparing artificial neural networks to mice, you're comparing mice to mice, what you get is that the regions show greatest similarity with themselves across mice. So primary visual cortex in one mouse is most similar to primary visual cortex in another mouse. Viz LM is most similar to Viz LM in another mouse. And this tells us that this analysis of representational geometry is picking up something real with respect to the biology. It's not just craziness. Okay. So then, um, how we're actually gonna train our networks is with this contrastive predictive coding. So the way that this works is you take a convolutional neural network, and at the top of it is a recurrent neural network, and over time you feed in segments of your videos, so frames of your video, and then you use your recurrent neural network to generate a prediction for what the input into the recurrent neural network out of the convolutional neural network is going to be in the future time steps. And this prediction then is going to be trained to match, so z hat at t plus one is our prediction, and it's gonna be trained to match the actual output of the convolutional neural network, z at t plus one. And we train it using this loss function here. Um, it's called contrastive predictive coding because as you can see in the loss function, what we do is we actually, so we try to increase the similarity. This is just the dot product, so it measures the similarity of the prediction, z hat, to the actual data z. And then uh, we try to increase this similarity while simultaneously decreasing the similarity of the prediction to the other frames in the movie. This is an important trick for getting the actual system to le learn well and to not just predict the same thing at every time step, which would be a trivial solution if all you were doing was trying to match the predictions. Um, but this is a slight technical detail. Okay. so. Um, we then train it on the UCF 101 data set. This is a big data set of videos of people engaged in actions, and the actions are categorized. And this is going to be useful for us because then we can do a supervised task if we want, where we try to predict what the, where we try to say what is the action in this video based upon the inputs to the ConvNet. But the training that we're doing here with the contrastive predictive coding is purely unsupervised. There are no labels, you're just training the system to predict future inputs. All right, now what do we find? So if we train a single pathway, so we've got just one pathway of convolutional neural network with this recurrent neural network engaged in the prediction task up at the top here, and we examine the representational similarity uh, of the neural network across layers, so the x-axis here is layers, with different regions of the mouse brain, what we find is that for the ventral regions, as you, once you've trained your network, you see an increase in representational similarity uh, as you go through the layers of the network. And this is important because what we're doing here at the bottom, this is just the representational similarity of the images themselves with the representations in mouse cortex. So this is kind of a baseline for you because that tells you if, if all that your system was doing was just preserving the image statistics, what would your representational similarity be? So we find that um, in these ventral regions, we get better representational similarity relative to image level. But in the more dorsal regions, we don't get that. The system's representational similarity actually just decreases relative to the pixel level similarity as you move through the layers of the neural network. So that would seem to suggest that this prediction task actually just requires a what pathway. It just requires some prediction of what you're going to see in the image in the future. But here's where things get interesting. Now, if, oh, sorry, I should summarize this data. So if you now look at just the peak representational similarity across the different regions of mouse cortex, you can see that, um, so here we're comparing to a few other models. We have 3D Gabors, which are sort of like a canonical model of visual cortex. Here we have an untrained neural network, so the same architecture with weights that have the same statistics in terms of their mean and standard deviation, but random. And here we have, an, uh, this is a, a, a network trained on object categorization, so trained on ImageNet, 
And then here we have our contrastive predictive coding network. And what you can see is that for the ventral areas, we get a better match to most visual cortex with CPC than an untrained network, the Gabor's, and also than an, better than an ImageNet network. And I think this is an important point. This is something that Dan Yaman's group has also found. You can actually get better fits to mouse cortex with, an, with a self-supervised loss rather than training on ImageNet in the ventral pathways of the mouse brain. However, when we look at the dorsal region, our network is doing no better than the untrained network. So it's not fitting dorsal representations. But this, as I was going to say a moment ago, is where it gets interesting. If we now introduce an anatomical segregation, so after the initial convolution, we split the network into two separate convolutional paths, which then merge again before being projected to the recurrent neural network. What happens is that in one of the paths, we get the same increase in representational similarity we saw with the ventral regions earlier, but now in our more dorsal regions, we also get an increase in the representational similarity. It's just it's in the other pathway. And so now we actually have the ability to fit both the ventral and the dorsal regions with this network. And this is a summary of those results. So here we're comparing our one, net, uh, one pathway network um, to untrained network and our two pathway network. And for the ventral regions, we get pretty much the same result with the one pathway and two pathway networks. But for the dorsal region, the, this most dorsal region AM, we now get a much better fit with the two pathway network as a result of that anatomical segregation. Um, now we wanted to determine whether or not this actually matters for functional specialization. So we looked at two different tasks, um, object categorization and motion discrimination. These are tasks that we know uh, are, the, the, are dependent upon the ventral and the dorsal pathways respectively. So if you get lesions to your ventral pathway, you're not gonna be very good at object categorization. If you get lesions to your uh, dorsal pathway, you're not gonna be very good at motion discrimination. So this is where random dots move in different directions and different numbers of dots move and you have to determine what the direction of movement of the coherent motion is. So what we do is we train the network with CPC and then we freeze the representations and then we just train a linear decoder on these tasks off of those frozen representations. And what we find is that if we train our linear decoder off of our ventral-like pathway, we get better performance on categorizing CIFAR-10 images, um, but not very good, actually terrible, no better than untrained performance in the motion discrimination. In contrast, in the dorsal-like pathway, we get slightly better than untrained uh, on CIFAR-10, um, but ultimately we do way better with the motion discrimination task, illustrating that indeed the representations that have been learned by these two different pathways support these two different forms of task that we know to actually be dependent upon the ventral and dorsal pathways in the real brain. Um, now what's interesting is that the two pathways also allows for good prediction with fewer parameters. So we actually have fewer parameters in our two pathway model, but we get as good prediction. And moreover, one of the things that's interesting is that we find that the single pathway model has some dorsal-like units, units that respond to movement, but not many. So what seems to be going on here is that there's a competition between ventral-like and dorsal-like representations, which in the one pathway model, the ventral-like representations tend to win, but in the dorsal-like, uh, in the two pathway model, they can split, they can specialize, and now you can have both forms of representation. Now, a critical point here is that when we do the supervised training, so we train on action classification, then we don't get this specialization. So instead, we find that we get kind of okay fits to the ventral pathways, they're not great, and very bad fits to the more dorsal pathways, indicating that it's not just the data set, it's not just the movies that lead to the specialization, but it's the specific predictive loss that's doing it. This is just a summary of that result for the supervised training, but I'm gonna move fast because I'm running out of time. So, to wrap up, these results demonstrate that optimizing to predict upcoming visual inputs is sufficient, and I wanna emphasize that. All this shows is sufficiency, but it's sufficient to induce what versus where specialization in a neural network. 
if you have this anatomical segregation. Now, two notes on this. The first is that with respect to this study, we can remain agnostic as to whether or not this optimization was the result of evolution or learning in life. I have my own guesses, but I don't actually care for the purposes of this study. All I'm telling you is that if you optimize on the prediction task, then you get these specializations. And so it could have been that this was something that was produced by evolution itself optimizing for prediction. Secondly, it's important to note that we can't rule out the possibility that there are other losses, including supervised ones, that might also work, that might also produce this specialization. We haven't done an exhaustive search of this, so just be aware of that. Two questions that I think remain from this are the following. Can we find inductive biases to ensure that specific pathways take on specific functions? So what I didn't mention to you earlier is that when you have this two-pathway model, it's random as to which of your pathways become the ventral and dorsal pathway. It's based on your initialization of the weights. And that's, of course, not the case in the brain. You're always going to have your where pathway in your dorsal parts of your brain and your what pathway in your ventral parts of your brain. So if we're right that the reason we have this specialization is because of this optimi optimization, there's surely other inductive biases or other losses that are helping to guide the uh, emergence of those specializations in those areas. And the other question is, could we do a better job then of matching neural representations by adding some additional losses to these networks? It's entirely likely that the brain is not just optimizing for prediction, but is optimizing for a variety of other things, which would be required to fully explain the representations. And as a last final thought, one of the things that I think this is interesting for is actually for AI and robotics. You never see anatomical segregation in AI systems or in robotic systems for motor control. But your dorsal pathway is what feeds into your motor cortex because knowing where things are and where they're moving is critical for motor control. So it might actually be better for many AI applications to actually have anatomical segregation and then an initial unsupervised predictive loss to train up your representations. I would argue control needs a wear pathway and this gives an avenue towards obtaining that. Okay, that's that. Thanks to Shahab for his great work on this. Also our collaborators on this, Timothy Lillicrap, Patrick Minot, and Christopher Pack, and of course the Allen for the data, and our sugar daddies. And thank you for listening. <laughs>